Hi, my name is Will Hammond, and uh, today we're going to take a look at creating a workflow to get that picture-perfect look to your images. Several years ago, I had the good fortune of attending one of Dan Margulis's workshops, and for those of you that don't know who Dan Margulis is, he's kind of a legend in the Photoshop business. He is the go-to guy when it comes to color theory and color correction. And Dan and I have talked several times about creating a workflow for enhancing images. He told me years ago that we're not trying to match reality, we're trying to make the client happy. So from now on, we're going to be working in what we refer to as happy color. Doesn't necessarily match reality, but the client is happy. Well, what I want to do is create a workflow that gives you that almost three-dimensional effect. This is going to be broken into a series of seven or eight, not really sure how many yet, tutorials on the steps that I take to create images. The first step I generally make is making selections. Now every once in a while you're going to get an image like this one that is artistically very good but technically very poor. And what I mean by this is the image itself was framed perfectly but it was taken on an overcast day which makes it look kind of dreary. Being that I'm in the advertising business I'm not really interested in capturing reality, I'm interested in, making, interested in making the image look good. So first thing I'd probably do is put in a new sky. If I put in a new sky, I'm also going to have to put in a new reflection. So what we're going to do is take a look at how we make better selections using channels. And in particular, I'm going to show you a brand new tool in Photoshop CS5. And, you know, inevitably, the one thing people ask me about channels is, well, I just want to know how to cut out a round hair. I just want to cut out hair. That's all I want to know. And that's much like saying, Will, I don't really want to go to medical school. I just want to do brain surgery. Well, Photoshop's now got a brain surgery tool. So let's take a look at it. I always say never use any tool that has magic, magnetic, or automatic in the name. And there's a reason that I and several of, several other Photoshop artists refer to this as the tragic wand tool. You know, it's one of those tools that the results are usually more tragic than magic. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to go up here and try and grab the sky. Now, holding down the shift key, I'm also going to try and select the reflection. If I replace the sky, I've also got to replace the reflection. Now, if I just jump down here into quick mask mode, you can get a really good look at what a terrible job the magic wand does for selecting fine detail. Selecting down in between the branches would be virtually impossible, and down here in the reflection, it's even worse. So what we're going to do is jump back out of quick mask mode. We're going to take this rough selection, we're going to go into Refine Edge. Now you'll notice that I had to click on one of the selection tools to get Refine Edge to actually become active. That's the only time that tool is visible. And what I'm going to do is click on this. Now Refine Edge was actually introduced back in Photoshop CS3, but it got a major upgrade in CS5 with a couple of really powerful new features. One of the neat new features is the view modes. You'll notice that we can display our current selection as Marching Ants as an overlay, somewhat like Ruby Lith or Amber Lith, for you old timers, as a black area, as a white area, or one that I prefer is on layers. I like to see that checkerboard pattern to see what's selected and what's not. What I'm going to do is zoom in here and now is when you get a look at what a very poor job the magic wand did. Well, the other really killer new feature is edge detection. This is the brain surgery tool. This is the tool that selects fine detail for you. It's not a perfect tool, but it is really powerful. What I'm going to do is turn on Smart Radius. Smart Radius basically says look for things that are a minimum of X number of pixels wide up to a maximum of X number of pixels wide. Now, the radius is X. I generally set this up around 10 or so. If you're doing really fine detail like hair, you might set it lower. But our branches can get pretty thick here, so we'll go up as high as, oh, maybe 9 or 10. Uh, how about, let's do about 10.6 pixels. Now, this tool right here is the edge detection brush. This is what determines 
what gets selected and what doesn't. And when I click on it, you'll notice that I get a monster big brush. Now, I know many of you know that the left and right bracket keys make your brushes smaller and larger. And the same key shortcut works here. I'm going to pull this out of the way and I'm going to paint right over these branches. Now, watch what happens when I let go of my brush. Can you see all the detail in there? I think that's absolutely startling. This is truly a killer tool. Now, if there was a negative to this tool, I would say it's this. You don't get to see what you're painting on. You're kind of painting blind. So you actually need a bit of an idea of where you need to paint in the first place. You can also toggle that preview on and off, but for the most part, I'm just going to paint where over, over where I think I need to knock out the sky and the reflection in the background. There we go. Now let's go up here to the view menu and I'm going to use black and white mode. Let's go up here to the zoom tool and zoom in on this edge. Now how many times have you dragged something out of one image into another one and you ended up with something that looked a lot like a ransom note? Does that look like a ransom note? I think it looks pretty darn good. So that's going to be our selection. This one tool is worth the upgrade price to CS5. But wait, there's more. Let's suppose you're selecting somebody with brown or brunette hair on a green background and you're getting blowback from the green background. This little output function right here, decontaminate colors, will take the green halos in her hair and make them brunette like the rest of her hair. So that's a really great feature. Now notice we're going to output this as a selection. We also have the option of making it a layer mask, a new layer, a new layer with a layer mask, or a new document. We're just going to make it a selection. Now, we're going to save this selection and come back and use it later. So we're going to save it as a channel. Now you may have heard the term channel, alpha channel, and mask all used interchangeably. They're all basically the same thing. It's just some people call them masks and some people call them channels. We're going to go up here to Select, Save Selection, and let's call this Sky and Water. You will notice I now have a channel called Sky and Water. Now, we're going to go get a new sky. How about this one called Replacement Sky? I'm going to take this sky and I'm going to drag it right over onto the pond image. Something new in CS5 is you finally get a preview of what you're dragging, which is small but pretty neat feature. I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to drop that right into my pond image. Now you'll notice these two just happen to be exactly the same size. In the production world we refer to that as a coincidence because it never happens when you try and do it. Do you ever take a headshot and drag it onto a new background and there's this giant eyeball looking at you? Well, remember, Photoshop doesn't really care about resolution until you go to output. What Photoshop really cares about is how many pixels wide by how many pixels tall. And these are both the same width and height. I'm going to go over here to my layer panel and just rename this Sky 1. I'm going to take my Move tool and I'm going to push this up. Now, one of the neat things that we have in Adobe Illustrator is the ability to reflect an image or an object. We don't really have that in Photoshop, but there's a really easy workaround. If you're on the Windows platform, you can hold down the Alt key, or if you're like me and you're on the Mac platform, you can hold down the Option key, and then go to Edit, Free Transform. Now you can't see it yet, but we're now working on a copy of the Sky 1 layer. Let go of the Alt or Option key. We're going to go up here to the reference point. That's what this little box is up here. We're going to choose the bottom edge as our reference point, and then go to Edit, Transform, Flip on the vertical axis. You will notice it is now flipped that sky layer down in position of 
the reflection in the water. If I go over to the upper right hand corner here and choose accept, I now have two layers, sky one and sky copy. Let's rename this top layer and let's just call it reflection. And I guess logically it should be underneath the sky. Now, I guess in theory you could merge those two layers together, but I don't think I want to do that. Because what I really want to do is I want to take the sky and manipulate it separate from the way that I manipulate the reflection. So I'm going to hold down my shift key and select both of these layers. We're going to go up to the layer panel options and put them in a group. Let's call up this group clouds. Now I have a folder full of clouds and a pocket full of rainbows. Blech. I think you get my point. I now have a folder full of clouds. We're going to take this and we're going to change the blending mode of the entire folder. Right now we have what's called pass-through turned on. That means whatever mode each of the individual layers is set to, it passes through the folder. What we're going to do instead is put the entire folder in multiply mode, which essentially means make light areas transparent and make dark areas darker. And you'll notice that what this does is it kind of gives you that almost backlit feel. Well, I can move the layers around as a group because it is a folder. And what I want to do is I want to get this cloud right here matching right here. We're going to kind of pull that down a bit. And you'll notice that we can still see the clouds inside the trees. We'll address that in just a minute. For now, though, that color looks a little bit off the scale to me. So let's pull the opacity down just a bit. And you'll notice that the, the uh, lake image down here, the pond, is a little darker because the layer underneath it is darker in that place. Now, we need to address the trees. To this folder, we're going to add a mask. You can put layer masks on layers, but you can also put masks on folders. We have our channel over here called Sky and Water. We're going to load that as a selection. Now there's a couple different ways you can do that, but the most straightforward way is hold down the control key on Windows, that's Command on Mac, and just click right on the thumbnail preview of that layer. Control click. Notice that we have the reflection selected, the sky selected, but the trees are protected. We're going to go over here to the layer panel we're going to, working on the cloud folder, we're going to go to the bottom of the layer panel here and we're going to choose Add Layer Mask. Now, just by adding a new sky and a new reflection, we've changed the whole attitude of this image. But we are by no means finished. Let's take a closer look. Does that look like a ransom note? As a matter of fact, if you unlink the layer from the layer mask, you can see it's really a storm that's coming through. I have no life. All right. Well, making selections is step number one. When we come back, we're going to take a look at how to enhance color.